That's a good plan. Yeah, okay. So before we dive in, out of curiosity, how many? Sorry, let me just let the video team know to start recording. There you go. Okay. okay. That sounds like a good idea. Video teams, always a good thing. I remember the first time they tried to video things at a Debian developers conference, and I was not actually very happy about it because it sort of interrupted the flow of the conversation. Yep. And about six weeks later, when I went back to watch the videos of some of the conversations that had meaningful decisions and outcomes, I was a total convert. So ever since then, I actually sort of go to great pains to be as nice as I can be to video teams because, <coughs> wow, it's just awesome. So are we good? Yes. Excellent. So before we dive in, out of curiosity, how many of you have ever flown a model rocket? Awesome. <laughs> how many of That's ever, unusual. How many of you have ever flown a rocket bigger than like an SD's model rocket? A couple of those? Cool, cool. No. Yeah, that's kind of what we do. We're going to talk about that today. Before we dive in, I'm BDL Garby. <coughs> uh, I see a lot of faces in the audience I don't recognize, along with a few really cool old friends that I haven't seen in like as long as I've years? had kids, apparently, which means it's at least 25 years. Yep. Wow. Um, <coughs> I'm back to being early retired. This is early retirement 2.0. Um, <laughs> I'm spending my time doing things like uh, helping on the uh, project evaluation committee for the Software Freedom Conservancy and you know, still doing lots of things in Debian space. Keith? I'm uh, Keith Packard. I work at Hewlett Packard Enterprise as well as in my day job. I'm a distinguished technologist over there working on uh, memory driven computing and a bunch of other, uh, other stuff, but we're not talking about that at all today. Correct. Um, and I've been doing, I also am the, kind of one of the primary authors of the X Windows system, so if any of you use X, then you're using my software, and if any of you use Debian, you're using BDL software. So. Wow. <laughs> <coughs> that's, that's a collaboration, as all these things are. Yeah. Uh, so, in fact, what we're going to talk to you today about is a collaboration. We, we've been known to describe ourselves as uh, uh, two grown men with a shared chemical addiction. Um, <laughs> in this case, it's to ammonium com perchlorate composite propellants. Um, we both like to play with high power model rocketry stuff, and that has led us to do what we think is some really interesting open hardware and open source software stuff that assists with the hobby. So what we want to do today is um, <coughs> we're going to talk to you a little bit about the rocketry hobby. It's cool that so many of you have at least flown a model rocket before. I can't tell you how long it's been since I had a crowd that had that high a percentage of people who did that. That's just <laughs> awesome. Um, <coughs> and then we're going to talk a little bit about the role of avionics in the rocketry hobby um, and because that's sort of the thing that we've ended up putting a lot of attention on. And along the way, um, just to be totally bluntly clear about this up front. Everything that Keith and I do is done with 100% free software. <coughs> we don't use any commercial tools in the development of these products and the development of the software. Um, we have actually had people walk up to us at rocket launches in interesting parts of the country with boards they have built using our published design data asking us that one final question they didn't understand about how to get it calibrated so they can actually go fly it. And we think that's just awesome. There are a number of uh, high school and university teams <coughs> in the US and an entire uh, rocketry competition in Brazil that are based on people using our products and many of them are uh, modifying the firmware and making our boards do things that we hadn't thought of before. And that's just, for us, it's totally cool, totally neat. Um, and it's kind of from a high school student this week. Yep. <coughs> yep. <coughs> uh, found a found a minus sign missing. <laughs> it's like oh god. Um, and fortunately, it's you know not as embarrassing as it might have been. But um, and including running the business, we run a web storefront to sell stuff entirely done with uh, open source software. There is of course a dividing line when eventually you have to deal with people like the United States Postal Service, and I don't have much control over what they run. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the notable flights and some other things that we're working on. But <coughs> the, th the thing we really want to emphasize is this is two of us who've taken a shared hobby passion and sort of a lifelong commitment to major free software projects and communities and turn that into something that we think is kind of cool and sort of uh, other people have used before as a reference example of how you actually can go do cool, open hardware, open source, and actually run a business that makes money on it. So, not a lot of money. <coughs> um, 
It's a small, ho it's a small hobby, unfortunately. It, we, we've turned what would otherwise be a really expensive hobby into a source of minor income, and uh, our wives think that's pretty cool. <laughs> So the basic idea, we like to build, launch, and successfully fly hobby-sized rockets. Um, and part of why this is so cool is that there are so many things that intersect in the rocketry hobby. There's different kinds of engineering, uh, from aerodynamics uh, and you know, materials, stress, and all of those sorts of things in the design of the airframes, to uh, propellant chemistries, <coughs> um, uh, all kinds of, of airflow uh, issues, both in uh, the way the motors work and the way the airframes work. There's the whole physical craftsmanship thing. We build stuff at home from scratch. Uh, my son recently was working on a level three uh, high power certification project and he was wrapping uh, phenolic tubes with fiberglass himself and laying up custom carbon fiber skin fins using vacuum bagging. Um, he actually took advantage of some facilities that were available at uh, his college, but we have some of those facilities at home too. And these all end up being sort of opportunities for dem learning <coughs> new skills and demonstrating sort of physical <coughs> craftsmanship. Um, particularly as my son was growing up, this was an excellent excuse for us to go camp out in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Because surprise, surprise, when we fly big rockets, <coughs> our safety code demands that we fly those far away from people and structures and things that we might harm. So we fly in places like the Pawnee National Grasslands in northeastern Colorado, or in the middle of a bunch of plowed wheat fields in southeastern Kansas, or... In the middle of the, the, the back ends of, of Washington and Oregon out in Mansfield, or <coughs> Mansfield, Washington, where there's and nothing. Brothers, Oregon, where Brothers it's Oregon. like cat litter with sage everywhere. Um, <coughs> <coughs> it's, but, places but you would never go for any other reason. Well, the only other people we know that go to places like that are folks who do things like stargazing, who like to get away from city lights. And so, surprise, surprise, when it gets dark <coughs> and we're not doing night launches, which are kind of a thing unto themselves, uh, they're often telescopes out and people you know, <coughs> hanging around doing that sort of thing as well. And honestly, <coughs> there's this just gut-wrenching, visceral thrill every time we launch. <coughs> it doesn't really matter. The thrill sort of scales a little bit with the amount of motor propellant that we're burning. It's absolutely true that when somebody flies a really huge project that weighs a few hundred pounds on the rail, um, everyone's you know nervous energy is much higher than when we launch off a little Estes rocket on an A83. But we still actually stop and watch the Estes rockets launch because that is in some ways every bit as cool. And since Keith and I both have a really big interest <coughs> in sort of passing along our enthusiasm for science and technology to more generations, hopefully more than just one, um, we really enjoy watching particularly young folks getting involved in the hobby flying little stuff. And in fact, you know, <coughs> these are some of the things that, the kinds of things we're talking about. This was a, a, a family uh, group photo uh, that I took several years ago <coughs> uh, of interest. This airframe over here with the yellow fin can and sort of crazy backwards fins, I think was the first rocket Keith ever built himself as opposed to mentoring <coughs> students. Rocket Robert mentored me to build that. Yes, my son actually helped. The red one in the middle was my son's first sort of high power share frame. The one with the red nose, black band, and, and yellow was my first high power airframe. And lots of sort of SD scale things. <coughs> and uh, we had a heck of a lot of fun even when we were flying things at that sort of scale. Um, and <coughs> that sort of you know, leads us to this whole, so okay, how do we get to avionics? Well, uh, first off, I'll mention that that photo is of the first airframe I built to try and get a level three high power certification. I say tried because the only parts of that airframe I ever got back were the red parts. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there's a long story to that I won't bore you with today, but um, the reason I didn't get the rest back turned out to be a bug in the firmware of a commercially available flight computer or altimeter, and um, uh, you know, long twisted path, um, Keith and I now are the premier producers of stuff that actually works right in this market. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, avionics, what's the point? Well, because we like to fly these things more than once, the most important thing is the ability to control deployment of recovery stuff, and by that I mean parachutes and streamers, that sort of thing. So that we can do things like at the top of the arc, at the apogee of the flight, we can <coughs> have the airframe separate into a couple pieces that are tethered and maybe or maybe not have a drogue parachute attached to them. And then as they're descending and getting close to the ground, we'll have another pyrotechnic event that separates the airframe in another place and puts out a big parachute so that everything sets down gently um, and nothing's damaged. 
and we can go retrieve it. Um, flight data is always interesting. I think every kid who's ever launched an Estes rocket has wondered, how high did that go? Well, we make boards that you can use. Uh, this is our smallest product we'll talk a little bit about later. This weighs less than two grams. <coughs> and so it, it's easy to toss in a payload bay of even like an SD size rocket. And it will tell you to about a 10 or 20 centimeter accuracy what the altitude was that the airframe went to, which is pretty cool. Um, and you know, other questions. Uh, <coughs> when people start flying bigger things, one of the questions that often comes up is, gee, did I bust mock with that flight? Did the airframe get going fast enough to go faster than the speed of sound? And things that you hear at the launch site can be very confusing in this regard, because a lot of times you'll hear a pop, and it's actually some bit of the propellant casting tube temporarily clogging the nozzle and then being spit out. It makes a pop that many people confuse as being like a mock boom or because something. Because if you're sitting at the base of the rocket when it takes off or reasonably close to it, you will never be within that uh, mock shockwave, so you will never hear. You, you don't actually hear it, so a, a you just don't know. Boom. Well, we make electronics that will very clearly help you understand how fast you are. And what's the difference between science and just goofing off, BDO? <laughs> Data. Ready? <laughs> 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 and, and honestly, part of what is so fascinating to us about the rocketry hobby is that it is this in incredible intersection of geek and redneck culture. <coughs> <laughs> and, you know, some of us have one foot firmly in both camps. And the way you can tell the difference is the rednecks on the crowd, what they really care about when they go to launch a rocket is getting the rocket back to fly again. Unless the reason they don't get it back is they put a crazy big motor in it and it was destroyed in some spectacular fashion. <coughs> and then they sit around the rest of the launch, you know, kibitzing with everybody else about you know, how awesome that explosion <laughs> how awesome was, that explosion was um, <laughs> or the shred or whatever. Um, the, the, the geeks in the crowd, um, they'd love to get the airframe back. What they really want is the flight data. <laughs> and uh, we'll show you a couple of photos later of airframes that did not really come back intact, but we got the flight data and we know what happened and we can tell you exactly sort of what why the issue was. Why the explosion was so spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> and I will admit there are people at our launches in our community of rocketeers who sort of look at us and just shake their head when we're sitting around in the evening, you know, talking about minutia of what happened during the flight. But um, this is what it's all about. And then finally, one of the things that we've been really enthusiastic about and it's been sort of a cornerstone of our products from the beginning is, is radio telemetry links. Um, and nowadays, most of our boards have GPS receivers on them and the radio telemetry includes live information, not only about how fast is the airframe going, how high it is, is it spinning or not, all of that kind of stuff, but exactly where is it? and that makes it really easy to go find them. Um, it turns recovering a rocket kind of into a geocaching experience, except that there's actually something cool to get when you get to it. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> and you know, uh, way back when, as I said, even really simple flight data is fun. That's my son with his first sort of mid slash high power rocket. That must be, wow, that's gotta be eight? 2007? Yeah, something like, like that. like eight. Yeah. It was his first quote-unquote big rocket, and um, we had this tiny little board we bought from somebody else. There it is with a pencil, number two pencil tip for scale. It was basically just a barometric pressure sensor and a microcontroller, and it would record the barometric pressure through the flight and just keep track of what the peak altitude was, i.e. the lowest pressure. And then when you powered it off and back on, there was an LED at the bottom there that would just flash out, um, you know, sort of in how many flashes, uh, how high the thing went. And uh, it, it was amazing how that turned what had been a really fun hobby into a really cool sort of learning and discussion experience. Because now he could go get three different motors, you know, different <coughs> performance characteristics, and fly them. And we could actually see the difference in the altitude that put the airframe to on the same day. And all of a sudden, we were having engineering conversations uh, over lunch instead of other things. And then, you know, as you move along, then you eventually get to where the motors that you're flying are bigger than the Estes rockets you started with. That's a, a baby L motor. Um, by the way, in those of you who played with rockets, probably remember the Estes motor code where the letters are a rough doubling in the total thrust of the motor. So B motor is twice as much as an A and a C is twice as much as a B. Um, that's a baby L. <coughs> and uh, I have now flown, uh, I've flown an N. Yep. I've got an O ends. flight coming up soon. And uh, yeah, we've both flown ins at this point, I guess. 
Uh, we have friends that have flown P's, Q's, R's, and one S that I know of. So, so remember, it doubles every letter. So yeah, use your power to tune about knowledge. So a lot of new, yeah, an O by the way is like a six inch diameter motor about three feet long in terms of the propellant grain size. Question. So do you make those yourself and what is the oversight on those <laughs> So um, yeah, I can delve in that just briefly. We talk a little bit about the research motor stuff later, but um, most people who are flying in the rocketry hobby are using commercial motor reloads where the, uh, in that case, that uh, thing that I'm holding is an aluminum motor casing <coughs> with a steel, you know, closure on the end of it. But everything that's inside of that aluminum motor casing was a commercial reload kit, in this case made by a company called Cesaroni in Gormley, Ontario. Um, they're one of the sort of three big makers of commercial reloads in this size. Uh, Aerotech Industries is the other really big one. They're sort of in California and Utah and I don't know where else. Utah. Mostly Utah. <coughs> Um, and so most folks in the hobby are buying reusable motor casing hardware and then are buying uh, expendable reloads. <coughs> and the reload kit comes with the fuel grains, the uh, ins uh, thermally insulating liner tubing, O-rings, gaskets, all that kind of stuff. Um, and <coughs> uh, you know, even with uh, commercial reloads made by people that know what they're doing, the folks assembling those motors into motor cases don't always get it right, and sometimes there's issues with the propellant manufacturer. So it still gets exciting once in a while. <coughs> uh, we say that every rocket flight's exciting. The ones where things go wrong sometimes get really exciting. Um, but yes, there is sort of a subculture within the hobby of people doing propellant experimentation. Um, I'm one of those people, and we'll talk about that some more later. Yep. Uh, what's like a typical failure from a reload? It ranges. Um, I saw a guy do a level two certification flight where he didn't understand that he had to put the reload inside the aluminum casing before he put it in the rocket. Oh, yeah, you got it. And then it's just like a it was a reload kit that unfortunately was almost entirely ready. It, you really just had to slide into the case and thread it in and you were done. Uh, he didn't actually remember to slide it in the case and thread it in. So he just had the plastic liner tube with the fuel grains <coughs> inside of it and he put that in the rocket. and. And so the interesting thing, it doesn't, quote, explode, unquote. They're not explosives. They burn actually very slowly. After eight years, we actually got a federal judge to rule in our favor on the lawsuit. Um, after 2000, you know, September 11, 2001, the ATF updated their explosive list, and they put ammonium perchlorate composite propellant on the list of banned explosives. And all of a sudden, folks like me had to have a federal low explosives user's permit to go fly rockets, and that sucked. So our two national organizations banded together and filed suit in federal court saying that was an arbitrary and capricious um, declaration and it should be overth overthrown. It took eight years, but in the end, the federal judge says, yes, you're absolutely right. <coughs> These are not explosives. That was arbitrary and capricious. Not only must the ATF take APCP off the explosives list, they must forever footnote in the orange book of explosive stuff that it's not an explosive. <laughs> And so we won big time on that. But <coughs> the reason is that unless it's contained, this stuff burns really slowly. I mean, it burns faster than a lot of things in this room. Not as fast as paper. Mu yeah. <coughs> uh, Keith was sitting there last night, you know, falling asleep watching propellant test strands of mine burning because it's, it's six, pretty seconds, boring. six <laughs> seconds a centimeter or something. It's not as fast as a road flare. <coughs> Until you contain it, because the burn rate tends to be sort of proportional to pressure, you know, all these things. So what ends up happening, a typical failure mode <coughs> is something happens that causes there to be too much surface area burning all at once. That drag, drives a big pressure spike, and you get kind of a boiler explosion sort of thing. There's a mechanical failure in the casing. It spits out the nozzle, spits out the forward closure. That's what we try to design the cases to have as their failure modes, at which point the pressure containment's gone, it's back to just being something that's sitting there smoldering, but the energy that's released can cause, you know, if the forward closure goes, it might go up through the airframe, wreaking havoc as it goes. Um, we have occasionally seen, well, we saw an <coughs> O-motor on a remote launch trailer in Kansas a couple of years ago on Labor Day weekend, uh, where they clearly had a problem casting the propellant grains and they were porous, i.e. there was a lot more bubble surface area in there than they thought. 
and within a fraction of a second of igniting the motor, it overpressured so badly that the entire case ripped lengthwise and the pressure shock wave completely destroyed the airframe and the launch trailer that it was attached to. Big cloud of dust. Uh, when, it, when it was done, there was nothing on the horizon. It was really amazing. <laughs> um, but, but nobody was hurt. This is, you know, our safety code says a motor <coughs> that big that's a research motor, the standoff it was, it was distance a mile is and a half away. Uh, a mile plus away, you know, everybody was standing when we lit it off. <coughs> and uh, so, yeah, I mean, we do crazy things, but we tend to be pretty safe about it. But anyway, when you get to where you're flying motors that are of this sort of scale. Well, you need in an airframe, that's a 75 millimeter diameter, about three inch diameter airframe that's, I don't know, what is that, 10 feet long or something. Um, and this one went to 14,141 feet, which is, you know, 4.3 kilometers or something above ground. This is back before we were making electronics. So I had a little radio beacon in there. We used that to find it. Um, 2.4 kilometers downrange, it was quite a walk. But as you can see in the Pawnee grasslands, it was pretty dry that year, but pretty easy walk. <coughs> um, it's a gorgeous place to hike. This is the board that was in there controlling deployment of the parachutes. It just has a barometric pressure sensor again and a microcontroller that's programmed to, you know, fire one charge at the top of the flight and one at a pre-programmed altitude on the way down. That is the make and model board that had the firmware problem that caused a problem for me a couple of months after that when I went to fly a cert flight. So as I said, the reason we ended up doing Altus Matrum is <coughs> um, I, I literally, I lost a, a major rocket project, um, you know, about a year's worth of work and a kilobuck or so in, in materials, uh, to a firmware bug and a commercial product that was proprietary. <coughs> and being the kind of guy I am, that just didn't sit very well. Um, and so there were some other people doing non-commercial kinds of things at that time. If you went back, it, it, you know, I'm talking about 2007 or so. If you went and did you know, searches on the early web back then, you could find people who were doing more open designs, but they were all kind of amateurish, and they had that sort of, this is my high school science fair kind of feel to them, and that was cool. <coughs> I, I don't want to diss that, but I, I realized very quickly that that wasn't going to make me happy, <coughs> that I thought there was an opportunity to do something that was a little more integrated, and in particular, when you start adding things like radio transmitters, and you're very close to circuits that are gonna fire pyrotechnic charges, worrying about RF interference issues and sort of good quality electronics design, things that I actually had degrees and professional experience in, uh, seemed like they would be worth doing. And then I got really, really lucky. Uh, Keith and I were sitting together at a conference in the fall of 2008, and a friend threw me a little proto board that had <coughs> an evaluation board that had a new RF system on chip on it that was a 8051 microcontroller plus a digital radio all on one chip with you know a bunch of IO stuff. And the, the, the clincher was he says, hey, seven bucks, bucks quantity one from DigiKey, and just blew my mind. The problem was I had already been on a path of designing something using a different processor, and I realized, oh crap, this is a complete do-over. I have to throw away everything I did, but this part's too cool. I gotta figure out how to use it. And I was sitting there sort of buried in you know that sort of designer's remorse of, oh crap, I have to throw everything away and start over, and Keith says, would you like some help? <coughs> and uh, that's when we really sort of got involved in doing this stuff together. So you want to talk a little bit about these things, Keith? Sure. <coughs> so um, back in 2008 when we started doing this, we tried to figure out what we wanted to fly. One of, the key, one of our key business objectives is we aren't going to build anything that we don't use. Because if we don't use it, we're not interested. We're not going to be passionate enough about it to support it, <coughs> and the design of it's not really going to be tuned for us. That really aligns with you know a lot of the businesses that Vito and I have worked in over the years, where the best products come out by the people who design them, who also use them. Who are passionate about passionate them. about them. So we do we do a bunch of different products. Um, uh, we we make these tiny little altimeters for rocket competitions. Uh, we make um, we make. Uh, flight computers for high power rockets. This is a uh, this is the newest one that, that B Dale let me design. I don't know why he let me design it. Oh, I did the RF end of it. But um, actually, I ended up redoing it because it could, wasn't small <laughs> enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you so we have no idea if it works or not. Yeah, so it hasn't actually. This one, this is a prototype. It is not. Well, actually, no, that's a commercial unit. We, we've actually sold some, but I still haven't actually done our performance testing on it. Would be it. nice um, to know. Would be nice to know. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, this is the smallest one of the boards we do that actually has a radio, a radio telemetry on it. 
and it's what a half inch by an inch, inch and, and a, half. a half or so yeah. long. Um, this one does not have GPS, but it does support two pyrotechnic channels, one for Apogee, one for main parachute deploy on the way down, and has full live radio telemetry during the flight along with radio direction finding afterwards. And this is actually based on an ARM microprocessor. So this has the smallest ARM that I've found. It's four millimeters square for a 32-bit processor. It's 40 Jeez. milliwatt radio. I know. It's like, yeah, yeah. it's and awesome. about a 40 milliwatt radio. 40 transfer. milliwatt radio, half a megabyte of storage to store the flight data. I mean, a barometric sensor good to 30 kilometers. I mean, and we've ended up. <laughs> one of the things we did when we got started is we took some of the experience I had building amateur radio satellite things, which we'll talk briefly about later. Yep. And we applied that. So the uh, the uh, the encoding and modulation scheme that we're using is actually really efficient. So. Uh, it's a 40 milliwatt transmitter, but it's using a forward error correction scheme that means that at 10 milliwatts, the math said 30 miles line of sight for an error-free link. And in fact, we had customers who did more than 10 mile terrestrial test paths, you know, hilltop yep. to hilltop, and reported that they had bodacious amounts of extra signal available. All of our boards now are made with 40 milliwatt transmitters. and. We have customers routinely flying well above 200,000 feet and just having no real no real radio issues, problems. And then so. we make things that are that have GPS chips on them because GPS is awesome. Uh, this one just gives you a little radio beacon, so it goes bleep bleep, and you have to use a radio that can tell you the the strength of that signal, um, and then you try to figure out what direction it is. Uh, radio direction finding is is a fun pastime. People out there are people actually out there that do fox hunting, which is an amateur radio activity. Um, this is like fox hunting, except you don't. Act, nobody knows where the target is, so you put it up in the air. Well, remember, I mean, your little Estes rockets. Sometimes you lose lose those in the sky, and they may go a thousand feet. Imagine putting up something a hundred thousand feet. It's only ten feet long. It's a hundred thousand feet away. You're not going to see it. So you have to have tracking, um, and GPS, of course, gives us actual position. So all you do is you you hook this up to your smartphone, and it shows you where your rocket is on a map. <laughs> it's like, how much easier is it then? Oh, we also make um, ones without radios because there are people who still don't have an amateur radio license, which I, mystifies me. Um, but they, they need something that doesn't use an amateur radio. There are people that sell uh, rocket trackers that use uh, commercial bands, and they use commercial radios. But those really suck for rocketry in a lot of ways. They're lower power because they have to be guaranteed not to interfere with anything. And they're always two-way links which means that if the link ever gets broken because the distance is just marginal, then it takes a long time for it to resynchronize, and you may never get the data back. By using a unidirectional telemetry link, we can have multiple receivers. We can, have, uh, we can eventually get out to the thing you know, t 20 miles away and eventually find it, or somebody else can come and find it. You can use a regular commercial radio to find it. So we get a lot of additional abilities, but we can only do that because we're, we're flying under the amateur radio uh, scheme, which is... You know, it's, a, a, it's really closely aligned with um, the open hardware movement because it allows you to do things on your own without asking the government's permission. So if you want to go do radio stuff, which is really awesome, you need to just go get an amateur radio license. You can use the 900 megahertz band. You can use the 2.4 gigahertz band. Oh, we use the 70 centimeter band, which is quite a bit lower, so we get better range. 435 megahertz. 435 megahertz. So you can use all the cool bands that we've used for non-commercial stuff but you can use higher power. You can build your own radios. You don't have to use a modulation scheme that's been approved by some f uh, federal board as, as not interfering with your television set because you're in the middle of nowhere. Who cares? <laughs> so <coughs> the first flight computer that we ever built, this is like a recent version of it, was called Telemetrum. Um, my daughter gives me crap all the time about my bad Latin, but the <coughs> whole idea was you know, <coughs> measuring at a distance. Um, and and so this board was loaded up with sensors. Uh, the version that we ship of it now, uh, ship now has a high G one axis accelerometer, which can show you what the acceleration performance of the motor was. That this part. <laughs> yep. Um, it's got a barometric pressure sensor that we use for getting altitude data, um, <coughs> and there's a GPS receiver, which is the big U blocks U -block part. part. Um, the GPS antenna is this ceramic patch thing on the other side of the board, sort of in the middle of the biggest ground plane we could come up with. Yeah. Uh, one of the challenges actually um, of being a really small manufacturer is that we have to pick things like those GPS antenna patches that are commercially available and already stocked by distributors somewhere. The minimum run quantity at the antenna manufacturer is to have one of those cut 
specifically for our boards is like 3,000 parts, which would be you know, multiple lifetimes worth of parts for us and fairly expensive. And so um, there's always this trade-off and compromise. It turns out, for the R folks in the room, um, this circuit board is too narrow to provide enough ground plane for the patch we really like to use on most of our products to actually tune well um, at the re required frequency. So I end up having to use a less good antenna with lower gain just to get something that will actually tune appropriately on this board. Nonetheless, the GPS performance is way more than adequate <coughs> on this board and uh, you know, customers seem very happy with them. And so this supports two pyrotechnic events. The screw terminal strip at the left end over there has two screws for hooking up a power switch, which would be mounted somewhere in the airframe. And then two terminals each for hooking up the Apogee and main pyrotechnic charges, which are typically electric matches that you put a little current through it and it fires off a little bit of a charge, which you use to ignite some black powder or whatever to separate the rest of the airframe. And there's other things this board can do, but that's really fundamentally what it's all about. There's a, this end of the board, which is on the left end on the lower photo, is the digital radio with a whole bunch of tiny little passive components on there implementing the Ballon Huge filters and passive stuff. components. <coughs> I need an inspection microscope to work on the board, so that qualifies as tiny, sorry. Um, and this board, by the way, is uh, one inch wide and two and two and a quarter, quarter long, something wide. like that, yeah. just to give you a sense of scale. Our first ground station, um, this is the current version of our first little ground station thing. And to give you a sense of scale, that's an SMA connector on the left side, which is, you know, about yay big in diameter. Um, yeah. Like, an SMA. Like one of those. Yeah. So it's, um, it's like this big. Yeah, it's about an, it's 1.1 inch square or something like that. Um, a USB cable plugs onto this side. So this is basically a USB to UHF radio transceiver. It is actually a full transmitter and receiver. <coughs> we use bi-directional communications when an airframe's on the ground and we're trying to configure the flight computer in the rocket or download flight data afterwards over RF. But during flight, we switch into a mode where the rocket's transmitting and we can have you know, as many people as, as available uh, monitor and record data from the flight. It was really amazing, actually. We sent the design of this board, the, the original version of this board, out for a modestly sized production run without ever building a prototype. Um, it actually turned on a work the first time. That was a first for me ever and <laughs> was massively nervous making. Um, but we've now sold many hundreds of these. And Steve. Radio Geek, um, what, uh, what's the data rate and what protocol do you do? Ooh. 38.4 kilosymbols per second with, um, uh, we're using GFSK with a rate one half constraint four convolutional code. And there's whitening in there, I forget. Yep. Yeah. And uh, interleaving. Yeah, white whitening and interleaving, so we get a pretty good bit spread. The the reason we picked that particular convolutional code is that the original radio system on chip we were using supported that in hardware. Well, and so, does this one, so does the new one. Sort of, yes. No, <coughs> it fully supports it. That's one of its two modes. It has that one and another one. Right. <coughs> and so <coughs> the experience I had playing with convolutional codes in satellite space caused me to understand that that would actually be really, really useful. And we get into these interesting arguments with people sometime. Uh, Keith and I had a long conversation three years ago, I guess, in Australia at Linux Conference Australia with Andrew Tridgell, better known as Tridge, who's uh -huh. very much in the middle of the whole uh, RG Pilot UAV code space. He's also one of the folks who's been involved in doing firmware for the um, open hardware design telemetry and telecommand radios that people use a lot in that space. And it's absolutely true that if you do this on a mathematical basis, um, just cranking the transmit power up a little bit balances all the forward error correction we're doing. And that works fine until you find yourself in the presence of something like a powerful radio radar system that's you know, generating a pulse that would trash every single packet that you're transmitting if you didn't have some forward error correction. And so this is one of those places where you know, we can talk about this tool blue in the face, but I will never build a radio-based <coughs> product that doesn't have this kind of forward error correction in it because we just ignore all that. I mean, we go out and fly and have a great time and get excellent telemetry all the time, and we watch people playing with other systems who, you know, used XB modules and all kinds of other stuff, and they spend about half the launch frustrated, and it's just not a way that 
I want to live. So, question. These are all bidirectional, except that we make a conscious decision that when an airframe flight computer detects that it's in on a pad waiting to launch, it switches into a unidirectional mode and just transmits. Because from an operational standpoint, the ability to have lots of receivers tracking one thing in the air and the ability to rapidly recover because it's always <coughs> you know, sending stuff um, makes that the right choice during flight. And, and just one minor point, do you have to transmit a call sign? Yes, yeah, of course. <coughs> yeah. Of course. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So Question? when. Well, sorry, I just have a quick but uh, I know you have mounting holes. Uh, how do people normally mount these in the payload? Do you have like a uh, wooden plane that bisects the, the yep. fairing and you attach things to that? Yep. Either, either wood or, or thin fiberglass, you know, G10 fiberglass sheets. Um, 16th inch fiberglass is pretty common, uh, eighth inch plywood is pretty common. <laughs> a lot of folks go nuts and use really high quality voltage Baltic birch plywood for everything on their rockets, even when it's not necessary. Um, because I have a vacuum bagging set up at home based on a kitchen food saver that's really easy to use, I tend to buy cheap eighth inch plywood and actually put a layer of fiberglass on each side to tighten it up. And Is that pretty hard to balance things uh, between the bullet board and the battery? No, nope. the, 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 rocket, the, the rocket is so long compared to its diameter that shifting the weight sideways in the rocket doesn't matter. It's, it's basically impossible to detect. It's, it's stabilized aerodynamically much more than uh, much more than there, there, there are larger projects where that could be an <coughs> issue. And in fact, we have a video on the laptop here of my successful second level three certification attempt. And what you notice is the moment the motor burns out, it starts corkscrewing like crazy because it was in fact dynamically unstable. Right. The weight was not at all centered and yeah, it just, you know, so you, 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 it can be more efficient if you're very careful about balancing it. But in a long, skinny rocket, it hardly matters. And even in a short, fat one, it doesn't make it unsafe to fly. It just makes it, it won't fly as high. So maybe, maybe more exciting to watch. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at, the, at the high end, uh, this is sort of the biggest board we make right now. And, and geometrically, it's an inch and a quarter by two and three quarters. So it's not a whole lot bigger, but it has six pyrotechnic channels, which allows us to do things like ignite upper stages, do staging events, uh, air starting motors, that sort of thing. It's got more sensors on it. In addition to the high uh, G accelerometer on one axis, it's also got an inertial management unit part that's got three axis accelerometer and three axis gyros. Yes, and with <coughs> you know a bunch of cool code running in the in the uh, arm cortex M3 that's on that board, um, we can allow these pyro events to be gated based on how many degrees off a of vertical you are. So you can say, don't ignite the upper stage if it isn't within about 20 degrees of vertical, because the last thing you want is the booster to have some problem. The thing lays over, aims at the crowd, and then you ignite the upper stage. And so, um, one, of the <laughs> one of the national uh, organizations actually was toying last year with making the use of this kind of stuff mandatory within the hobby for complex flights. And Keith and I kind of had to stick our hands up and said, uh, maybe not until there's a second manufacturer that's actually building stuff that can do this, because as much as the avarice side of my brain says, I'd love to have a lock-in that says, to fly a complex flight, you have to buy one of my boards. The uh, community-spirited side of me said, mm, no, 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 that's not good. So they actually sort of stepped one step back from the brink. But <coughs> it's a huge safety issue when we're flying huge, complex, multi-stage, air start, et cetera, projects. It's not as simple as, gee, you have to wait for the motor to burn out. It's then like, oh my god, what's going to happen? <coughs> Uh, we actually watched a three-stage project in northern Colorado where the first stage had a failure, and the second and third stages successfully did not ignite because they had this sort of tilt limiting stuff in them. And oh boy, was that good. Are you saying that these are, it's routine to have multi-stage rockets? Oh yeah. Yeah. If you want to go high, it's really hard to do that with a single stage. You just well, have so much weight left over and so much extra drag. So, so we have a friend in Texas who uh, hand lays carbon fiber airframes that are just stunningly gorgeous. I mean, when he's doing the tip to tip across the fins, he actually gets the carbon fiber weave and the fabric to align so you can't see where the seams are. <laughs> <laughs> totally uh, unnecessary and really cool looking. Uh, <laughs> he, he, he 
hit 126,000 feet last year with a two-stage hand-laid carbon fiber airframe flying an N to an M, I think. Um, did that out in Black Rock. So anyway, um, yeah, so this is, this is the board, this is the high-end board we make that folks buy when they're flying big complex projects. Yeah, question? Just a naive question. If you've got a lighter controller and you have gyroscope on a ship and this sort of thing, are people already, or are they talking about like, Guidance. Oh yeah. yeah. Yes. So so here we have here we have a, a new active stabilization. This actually is servo <laughs> control. So it's, you're not scaring. <laughs> it's it's not guidance. Right. It's guidance is active, a bad word. It's <laughs> <active> stabilization, <laughs> stabilization is a good is a good word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This actually has uh, uh, pyro channel. I mean uh, servo channel output, so we can actually connect the board to servos and steer with it. Yeah. We don't have the firmware done yet, but the hardware exists. Yeah, so there's a driver that will allow you to, you know, poke servos and play with them, but nobody's actually written. My, my son talked me into adding this to the board a year or so ago because he's a, he really likes Maverick missiles. <coughs> and in fact, I'll show you a photo of his current half-scale Maverick missile project in a bit. Um, and the problem with the Maverick missile is it's got a lot of fin. And so if you're building one that doesn't have actively controlled stabilization, you have to put a bodacious amount of nose weight in it to make it you know. This doesn't cause nervousness. Uh, that part know. does, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I'll, I'll show you the nose cone a little bit. For a six inch diameter nose cone, um, we turned the nose out of solid maple. Oh. And in order to make it heavy enough, we then cut a five eighths inch thick, five and a half inch diameter steel plate and bolted it to the back of the nose. And uh, you're going to put this up several thousand feet and have it fall towards about you. About 3,500 feet <laughs> on its first flight coming up later this month, yes. I'll show you photos of it now before too long. As Keith said, we make this is the same board but with the radio and GPS chopped off. It just does the tilt limiting six pyro channels and all that. The reason have you ever flown one of these other than testing? Why would I why would you why fly, would I with fly something without a radio? radio? <laughs> um, actually there are good answers. One of them is our friend who does the hand laid carbon fiber. Uh, carbon fiber is kind of RF opaque. And so he uses boards like this buried down in the airframe to control the flight and has his tracking stuff up in a fiberglass nose cone that's RF, o RF transparent. So there are, there are technically okay reasons for it, but that's the back side of that board. That's a shiny, prettier picture. It is. Way more with the camera. That well, it's you know. It's an angle. We we'll use the camera instead of. You know, <laughs> I, I was going to say, if, if, if I were actually a photography buff, um, I might take better photos. My wife actually is an award-winning photographer and, and artist, and finally recently decided she had to learn how to take good photos of her paintings. And so she has, in like the last six weeks, worked out how to take good photos of her paintings. And I said, oh, dear, can I bring up a bunch of my boards? <laughs> and she scowled at me. Eventually, <coughs> eventually I'll get her on board. This is the little GPS board Keith was talking about. That's, that's, that's the first version of this one. Right. Okay, so we've talked about avionics. Obviously, you know, we have this little business we're running on the side that we make and sell all this stuff. Um, but <coughs> what we also want to talk to you a little bit about is some of the other cool bits of free software that we use in the hobby. And to do that, we're going to step through a, things, a few things, starting with building rockets and talk to you about some of the programs we use. And these are, by the way, um, almost everything we use is packaged in Debian. Keith and I are both longtime Debian developers and I'm formerly Debian project leader and Debian technical committee chair. Keith is now on the Debian technical committee. Uh, so not surprisingly what we care about is you know is all this stuff Doesn't available in Debian. Debian. <coughs> and uh, the short answer is if you want to play with our stuff the easy way to do it is have a Debian machine nearby because you can just apt get install all the tools we use. Um, but they're mostly available for other distros as well. Uh, the first thing is for building rockets themselves, uh, one of the most important tools we use is this thing called Open Rocket. Um, it was, it's a rocket design and analysis program written in Java, runs cross-platform quite well. Um, this guy named Sampo Niskanen um, in Finland wrote this as his master's thesis project um, for his degree a few years ago. Um, and one of the things that he really worked on what because he was part of a university team that was building you know high altitude attempt airframe at the time is he did a good job of understanding how to change analysis techniques as you go through the transonic region and so for the first time we had a rocket simulation program that was sort of easy to drive to design an airframe that did a pretty good job 
of modeling the aerodynamics as you went through the Mach transition and you know well beyond. And people have designed and flown airframes you know up past Mach 3 using this and had pretty reasonable results. Um, it all gets a little squiggly when you get going fast enough that there just aren't a lot of flights out there for which we have data that we can compare to the simulations. And today there's still about a half dozen active contributors to this project. It's actively being worked on. I sit on the Devel mailing list and uh, there's another release coming fairly soon. We'll show you a screenshot of that in a sec. Um, <clears throat> there are a bunch of tools that we've used over time to generate G-code for running computer control machine tools to cut parts like centering rings and fins and all this kind of stuff. Uh, honestly, uh, OpenSCAD is what we've ended up using the most. It's really simple. Most people know this from the context of the 3D printing world, where it's not a bad way to design 3D solid geometry and output you know, STL files. Um, there are a couple of tool chains that will get you from uh, OpenSCAD into G-Code for running uh, CNC routers and mills. And uh, so that's actually become sort of our favorite environment for generating G-Code for that sort of stuff. And to your question earlier about uh, research motors, there's a tool called MotorSim that I use quite a bit that is GPL Java uh, that is basically a propellant combustion simulation tool. Uh, it understands enough about um, how the um, combustion of different propellants work that you can design grain geometries, put them inside, um, you know, specifically design uh, volumes representing the motor cases and get plots of how that propellant's going to burn and therefore what the resulting pressures and thrusts will be uh, for given nozzle geometry. And um, we're actually really pleased because there's several of these motor simulation programs out there. Keith and I between us have managed to convince two of the people who wrote uh, programs uh, to do motor simulation to each release their code under the GPL. One's a command line thing written in C that's clunky but works really well and the other one is this really nice pretty easy to use <coughs> big Java GUI thing which unfortunately doesn't support as many grain geometries and so forth. So uh, if this is something you're at all interested in this is a place where there's piles of uh, cool GPL code that's up on GitHub that I'd be happy to point people to and uh, we could use more enthusiasm to go work on the code. So, this is kind of what Open Rocket looks like. That's one of Keith's uh, 98 millimeter diameter, about four inch airframes down at the bottom. As you can see, you can sort of, you know, sort of show it where airframes and fins and coupler bits and internal masses and parachutes and all that stuff are going to be. And then when you run the simulations, it tells you things like how high is this going to go. Uh, how long is it going to take to descend you know, with a given amount of parachute and a given amount of weight from different altitudes using a standard model of the atmosphere. It can estimate what the drag is going to be and sort of tell you how fast it's going to descend, all that sort of stuff. And you can export from the current version of Open Rocket things like um, 2D drawings of uh, fins and centering rings and things like that so you can then go cut them. Um, my son is uh, a mechanical engineering student at Georgia Tech now where apparently they have an unlimited license to SOLIDWORKS and all of the available modules. And so not surprisingly, he's all of a sudden, everything he does, he's talking about how cool SOLIDWORKS is. Um, his level three project, he actually did stress analysis <coughs> uh, of the frame design before building it um, just because he could. <coughs> Um, and so it's entirely possible to use tools like that um, or FreeCAD, which has a fairly reasonable finite element module available as long as you don't mind figuring out how it works. Um, but it's surprising how many of us just use something like OpenRocket and go with the results. Yep. Uh, if you're a student like anywhere, you can get a full year of SOLIDWORKS for $125 and that has like pretty much unlimited yep. open. So it's really easy to get the software. Yeah, yep. first one's free. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah. We talk about motor vendors and the rocketry hobby the same way. They they they're real good on samples and discounts for certification flights and things like that because they know they got you hooked. It's just like standing around, you know, school playgrounds. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's all about chemical addiction. That's yeah. just. <laughs> But anyway, Open Rocket's really cool, freely available, um, downloadable. There's you know, it's a Java jar you can download and run on Windows or Mac or whatever. It's there's an installer package in Debian that I maintain. Uh, OpenSCAD, you know, there's a, a complex centering ring. That's one. You notice it's got some notches in it. That's so that the fins that are coming through the wall of the airframe can lock into the centering ring, which holds them 
uh, rigidly aligned. And those extra holes are for, you know, an extra set of motor mount tubes around the central one so we can do air starts. <coughs> uh, this is a ring that we did a while back when we were experimenting with the extra pyro channels on one of our boards because, as Keith said, we like to actually fly the stuff that, that we're selling. Uh, here's a CNC router cutting a ring, kind of like the one that was just there. This is very thick Baltic birch plywood, as you can see. We've laminated it so it's about an inch and a half thick. Uh, that was for a crazy project I wanted to go into more details on. But I will tell you that the CNC router is running Linux CNC. <coughs> um, there is actually no proprietary software anywhere in this process at all. Um, this is the nose cone for that six inch Maverick being cut. This is on a four axis CNC mill in my garage. Uh, unfortunately, uh, right now, this one is still running proprietary software, but all the pieces to convert it over to Linux CNC are in hand now, and my son is supposed to be arriving home from college today. So when I get back tomorrow night, one of the things we've already decided to work on this week is to get this converted over because he wants to spend the summer playing with CNC stuff. And he said, Dad, you're not going to make me use Mach 3, are you? And I said, well, you know, if you're willing to help with the conversion, then anything could happen. <coughs> Typical free software answer, right? You know, patches are accepted. Um, the resulting airframe is this. This is sitting on the floor. That's six inches in diameter and about five and a half, six feet long or something. Uh, its first flight will be coming later this month at the Tripoli, Colorado launch site in uh, Hartzell, Colorado. By the way, that launch site is awesome. The elevation at the launch rail is 8,800 feet above sea level. So everything goes a little bit higher there on the same amount of propellant because there's less air resistance. Um, this will fly on a K740 um, motor, which is a lot of motor. It's two inch diameter motor about yay long and uh, it should do 3,500 feet or so on its first flight. And, you know, I'm sorry I didn't find a photo of the nose cone with the horribly huge steel plate uh, bolted to the back of it because it's kind of impressive. Uh, my wife does not like to try and pick up and move this airframe. It's fairly heavy and she's tiny. Uh, okay, so uh, motor and propellant research stuff. As I mentioned earlier, most flights in the hobby are done with commercial reload kits, but Playing around with the chemistry and mechanical constructions of motors, it's almost a, it's almost a separate hobby. But there are a bunch of folks that I know uh, that I hang out with now that are really into this. In fact, I'm having fun right now. I'm building a 12 inch diameter, 12 foot long airframe. Specifically, well, <coughs> one of the two big reasons I'm doing this is I have a friend who likes to make really big motors and he doesn't have anything to fly them in. Um, and so it's a joint project. He's gonna make an arrive at the launch site with you know a motor that's six inches in diameter and several feet long and I'm bringing the crazy big rocket for it um, and we actually have a simulation that on one of the motors that we may fly Labor Day weekend this year out in southeast Kansas uh, we may bust mock on a 12 inch diameter 12 foot long airframe that weighs 170 some pounds on the rail which would just you know <laughs> that'd be cool yeah. is there anything preventing you from using liquid fuel like oxygen yeah. Other than practicality, costs, and all that, is there any legal reason? Yeah, we don't have any insurance for using that with our with our national clubs. We have to use solid or hybrid propellants. Is the only thing we're but insured if, to if fly. Money was no money. Is, if there's money was no. no object, so so I'll mention there's sort of three categories, if you will, of rocketry stuff out there. There's sort of model rocketry, which is SD size stuff, um, and there's a specific threshold in the rules. It's one and a half kilograms launch mass, 125 Six. grams of propellant. Yep. Um, that's about it. Yeah. Uh, anything below that, you don't have to notify the FAA. There's a set of rules, safety rules you're supposed to follow. This is the stuff that people go fly in parks and fields behind their farms and whatever, and it's just no big deal. Then the middle category is what we call high power rocketry, <coughs> and that's what the National Association of Rocketry and the AAA Rocketry Association sort of regulate within the U.S. Um, and for flights within that range, um, you have to do things like have an FAA waiver um, in order to fly things that are that big and going to go that high. And so typically the uh, local club will arrange a launch site. They'll negotiate with the landowner or the Bureau of Land Management, whoever they have to. They'll make sure that we're in adherence with all local and national fire code things. They'll negotiate with the FAA what the waiver is going to be. Interesting thing about the United States, we all have the right to use the airspace. So this is not a we have to gain permission as much as we have to negotiate with the FAA on what they're going to notify 
other uses of the airspace about because our use is an unconventional use and you would not want to be a pilot of a commercial airliner right flying right over one of our launch sites. Now, our safety code says we don't launch if we can see an aircraft in the area. But, you know, what ends up happening is at all of our launch sites that have waivers, they put out NOTAMs, you know, the noticed airmen, and at many of the sites this year, they're actually restricting the airspace. <coughs> TFR? Yeah. Yeah, temporary flight restrictions over the launch sites. Um, one of the sites we go to in southeastern Kansas, for example, the waiver there is 50,000 feet with an 8 nautical mile radius. And so the nice thing is we can actually fly all day there and never see a contrail. It's way far away from all the big air traffic routes. It's just a lovely place to go fly with really nice people. Uh, there are other places. We actually flew once with a club in New York State that had a standing waiver of 5,000 feet with windows to 12, 12 or 15. Mm -hmm and they were on the approach, approach path to the New York area airports. And any time they wanted to fly above 5,000 feet, they were on the phone constantly with air traffic control. And one day, somebody had a big project, and I was standing near the launch control table, and I heard the conversation. It was basically, you know, there, there's an Airbus coming over. As soon as he clears the airspace, you have about four minutes. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> They, they launched the rocket, it went up, it came back down, and I heard the controller over the air saying, you know, I, I show you back below 5,000 feet, do you concur? And he said, yes, we're back below 5,000 feet. And he says, great, there's an A380 that'll be over momentarily. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, you know, on approach, <laughs> it was the most amazing thing. And unfortunately, you know, that, that brings it, it sounds like you're literally one accidental or purposeful event away from that hobby being shut down. Yeah. Yes. Pretty much every, in fact, that club has lost their waiver and their launch site because they had a jerk in the club who just didn't care and busted the waiver like more than once in the same weekend, even after being told that was not the right thing to do. And unfortunately, at that particular launch site, the issues with the interaction with the FAA were such that they said, sorry, we can't, we can't deal with the risk. Uh, you lose your waiver, you're done. Uh, at a lot of other launch sites, you know, <coughs> um, somebody has an amazingly fortuitous day and, you know, the flight got recorded as 49,999 feet, but, <laughs> 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 well, you know, the ejection event was programmed for 47,000 just to ensure it didn't bust the waiver and... Not a lot of drag up Not there. Not a lot of drag yet. up there. The chutes didn't slow it down even. Well, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 we've had we've had days where <coughs> uh, the other interesting that ha things that happens is Keith and I are producing boards now that have GPS receivers that are good enough that when we've got solid lock, we've got sort of GPS level accuracy showing the apogee. Um, same boards, barrow pressure sensor using a standard model of the atmosphere might have a widely differing opinion about what the apogee altitude was just because on any given day, what's going on in the atmosphere can mean that those numbers don't exactly model, aren't exactly modeled by the standard model of the atmosphere. I've on the day thought that I had a perfectly legal inside the waiver flight until I got home and looked at the GPS data and went, well, the cool thing is, BDL, airplanes fly with the standard model of the atmosphere. They do. So <coughs> if you are legal on the standard model of the atmosphere, you're fine. So at the end of the, and at the end of the day, it's not like in most cases the FAA is sitting there, you know, with you know, some kind of a threshold detector right at the edge of the waiver. But you know, this is an issue of federal law and federal regulation, and you don't want to screw things up for the rest of the folks in the hobby. Yeah. Uh, what kind of restrictions do you run into when you use your GPS antennas since you're going very high and very fast? We don't go high enough or fast enough for it to be an issue. Okay. So the, 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 the COCOM restrictions that you're talking about are, are if you fly over 1,500 nautical miles an hour and are above 60,000 60, feet, <laughs> then the GPS is supposed to lock out. It's rare for it. Uh, we, we do do that. Obviously, we go faster than that above that altitude, but only on the way up. What do you mean lock out? The GPS will actually lock. stop you, telling you where it is. Why? It because is, they it don't is, want to it use them for missile guidance. It is an international legal requirement that commercial GPS receivers not be possible for bad guys to use to build missile guidance systems. The receiver only system, what do you mean it's locked out? It stops, the, the receiver stops giving you position navigation well, solutions. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. yes. So if you were hacking firmware, you could have Of course, of course, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. But these are typically <laughs> not <laughs> open designs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That brings up another point. Is it? 
Presumably the GPSs yeah. you're buying are just a, a black box. Yeah. Ish. And yeah. Not, you're, you're just paying attention to the data stream. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. So, but so they, but, open. but because what we're mostly interested in is detecting the apogee and being able to track it during descent, we're never going more than 1,500 knots at that time. And so we're never, uh, we're never, we're never above the COCOM limits. The other thing is that this is a very specifically chosen GPS module. There are two companies right now that make GPS receiver modules that have a <coughs> quote unquote high dynamic mode because they're meant to be used in all sorts of you know private aviation applications and things like that. Um, and actually, the drone market has gotten interesting. Um, and so, you know. Not surprisingly, put it in high dynamic mode. Despite that, uh, when our motors are burning and we're under you know significant acceleration, the GPS receiver is almost guaranteed to unlock because the um, algorithms they're using for tracking the signals coming from the satellites assume that you're not accelerating more than four Gs or so. And um, I've you know I've done well over seventy Gs off the rail before, so <coughs> it's not it's not a routine thing, but it happened. So anyway, um, yeah, playing around with this, um, there is now free software for doing motor simulation. This is the one I've been using. Um, those are thrust and pressure. Uh, you know, the pressure that you get is sort of proportional to the surface area that's burning. The thrust is sort of proportional to the pressure you know, with the nozzle geometry characterized. For a given propellant, um, you can characterize what its burn rate is at different pressures. This particular propellant, which is sorbitol, has an interesting characteristic that there's this sort of plateau where if you're anywhere within that plateau, the burn rate just doesn't change. A lot of people, therefore, target that plateau for their operating pressure on the motor. Mm, not me. I like more performance than that. So I'm usually up near the top of the curve there. But, um, you know, it's not exciting if it's not exciting, right? Uh, so here are some propellant grains that I was casting because I'm currently playing with uh, potassium nitrate and uh, alcohol sugars, which are diabetic sugar substitutes as the fuel. Um, I'm actually casting grains by basically melting the sugar, mixing in the potassium nitrate, getting a nice mix, and then pouring the grains. Those are Delrin coring rods, <coughs> um, which are easy to pull out afterwards. And then um, this is a typical test stand. Well, not so typical. This is a really good test stand. That's the motor up in the top of that pipe aimed down. So we're pushing against the earth, you know, to, <coughs> to, to it's measure what's really going on. It's a really big rocket. Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. Then you got a problem. Yeah. yeah. Well, somebody will have a problem. I'm not sure I'll be around long enough. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a pressure sensing orifice at the front of the motor, so we actually have a pressure sensor so we can measure the chamber pressure inside the motor casing. And there's a load cell in that test stand so we can measure the force that's being applied. Um, and down on the left is a cute little grayish box with electronics that, surprise, surprise, Keith and I designed. This is actually a wireless. Uh, test stand control board that um, about three weeks ago I got the first ever test burns on the first prototype of it and I've been sitting in the hotel room uh, here uh, writing the code to actually do the data analysis and plotting of the results. I'm thrilled that the first three motors we burnt on the stand I got really good pressure and thrust curves from so uh, this is just working and we're really happy and this will probably end up being a product at some point and who knows maybe I'll sell ten. <coughs> Um, this is sort of a niche within a niche. Do you want to talk a little bit about the electronics design tools? Sure. Um, so when we started this project, I hadn't designed electronics since I was a child, um, <laughs> literally. I think the last uh, time I put uh, an integrated circuit in a circuit board myself was probably 1979, when I built an 1802 based computer. Um, and, and it's been really fun because, um, because I've been w be, I, initially I got to watch BDL play with these uh, design tools. Um, and then he foolishly decided that I should, I should also play, be playing with these tools. Um, and he let me, uh, let me learn how to use them. We, we're using, there are kind of two major sets of open source design tools available. There's the GEDA suite, um, and then there's KiCad. And KiCad's an integrated program that does everything, design and uh, both schematic capture and circuit board design. And within the GEDA suite, there's two main tools, the schematic editor and the PCB layout editor. Um, and, you know, we talk about not being locked in, so you don't want to use uh, commercial software because you get locked into data formats. Well, even with free software between KiCad and GEDA, they don't quite yet speak compatible formats. There's work going on to make it's it It's actually being worked on right yeah. now to make it possible for them to exchange design data. 
But right now, we're locked into this tool suite. And it's like, I'd really like to go use this KeyCAD feature. And I can't, because the tools don't share the same data file formats. Which and is in annoying. particular, um, we have now a library of component data for all the parts we've ever used on a board, where the schematic symbols and the PCB you know, and drawings, the ordering data and everything is all, all that stuff. We have yeah. a data. We have a preferred parts database for Altus Metro <laughs> that has you know who we buy the parts from and you know what size reels they come on and all that sort of stuff. And uh, that would you know as everybody who's ever played around with electronic design automation tools knows, once you get invested in a tool chain, it would be hard to move. Hard to move. The and good so news is it's all free software, so you don't you don't have to like spend money to chase yeah. this if you want. But so what I recommend for when I have new pe new students coming in and asking me what tools they use, I say, well, there are these two. Um, and today, for new students who are just beginning electronics design, I usually <coughs> recommend they use KeyCAD, even though I don't use it myself, <laughs> which is a little odd. Um, and so here's a typical schematic capture. Uh, this is uh, this is the original Talamini, which is the first the earlier version of this board, and you can <coughs> see that it's it's really much much simpler. Um, it has just the single. Remember we talked about the CC1111. RF system on chip that has the CPU and the radio in it. And you can see here it's got it's got USB connectivity down here and it's got a radio out the other end. It's got, you know, all the pyro channels connected to it over there. And so you design this, you know, I I if you've seen schematic diagrams in, in your life, um, then this is what they are generated from is a tool like this. Um, and and when you and when you take that schematic and then you can convert it into a PCB. And the interesting thing about the integration of the tools is the PCB tool uses the data from the schematic to know how things are wired. And so you have a, you have a, you have a component here, like a processor, and it has a set of pins. And the, and the, uh, the, PC, the uh, schematic capture program generates a netlist. And the netlist says, connect pin one of this part to pin two of this part. And that's all it says. And so when you start the tool up, um, you can, you can, you've got all the pictures of your components that you've drawn by hand, and you stick them on the board, and then you push this button that says, okay, show me where all the wires are supposed to go. And it shows you this rat nest, and it's literally called a rat nest, of, of, uh, of yellow lines that go all over the board. It's like, well, I want to connect this pin over here to this component. It's just a yellow line. Or it's like, you know, this pin to this component over here. And so they just lines go everywhere. And so it's just kind of, it's like Etch-a-Sketch. You sit in there and you just kind of draw where the lines need to go. And then as you successfully connect stuff with the red lines and the yellow lines, then you push the, 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 the uh, show me what's going on button and the yellow lines go away. You slowly refine the design and you shuffle the components around. I um, mean, you go edit the sch schematic because it's like, wow, that pin is really <coughs> hard to reach, but I could swap it and use this other pin. So this is back and forth between the schematic and the PCB. And eventually you come up with a, a piece of artwork that's just a picture on the screen. But the awesome part about this is you can take that picture and send it off to a commercial board manufacturer and you get back physical PC boards that look just like the picture, which is really cool. And it's worth mentioning there there are you know some of these tool chains have automation, you know, auto routers and stuff to help you route traces. Yep. But when you're laying down RF sections, for example, uh, they're not terribly useful because yep. there are lots of rules that you want to adhere to. And this is where actual sort of electronics knowledge and experience has to be added to what the tool can do to come up with something that really, really works. And this is one of the things that's been kind of fun. You know, as Keith's been learning the tool, um, and in some ways, there's some parts of the tool he's actually gotten better at driving than I am, but... Um, <laughs> I don't I, know what part that is. <laughs> I, 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 I will end up staring at, at what he's done and going, oh, no, 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 you need no, to no. rotate this inductor, it's going to mutually couple to the side, you know, whatever. Whatever. <laughs> this and trace isn't <coughs> wide enough or it needs to be straighter, it's like... Keith, it, Keith, Keith, when this goes to manufacturer, we're going to get a crack in the trace because... Because, and, yeah. <coughs> and that's just totally experience, learned. yeah, it's just experience. Yep. So then we actually hand build most of our prototypes. And you know this is a, a stencil that's been cut out of, in this case, a Kapton sheet. And yeah. Does, does that previous tool, does that support duplex, like putting components on other yep. sides? Oh, absolutely. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, this, this, is actually, this is actually a four layer board with components no, on both sides. That one's a two layer board. Oh, but it does support oh, it is two four layers. layers. Yeah, hmm? it does support four layers. Oh, as many layers as you want. It supports as many layers as you want. Yeah, uh, we we typically use four layers these days because okay. it's just easier. This this is like yeah, detail like. Detail I, I, I I not long ago for the amateur satellite crowd designed an eight layer board and Sanity in, uh, uh, came in before we actually went to build them. Yeah, 
um, i.e. the board of directors went, no, 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 there's so many elements of risk in this project, let's do something simpler. Simpler, yeah. And it actually had nothing to do with my PCB design skills, mm -hmm. it was the rest of the project that was nuts, but um, yeah. Um, <coughs> So yeah, we use uh, you know you use a solder paste which gets screened through the openings in the stencil uh, onto the blank circuit board, and then you sit there with an inspection microscope and a pair of tweezers and a bunch of parts and a laptop with a design tool running back in the background there so that you can see where you know which parts are supposed to go where, and you hand place all these parts under the microscope, and you literally stick them in something like an electric skillet. I've gone high tech now. I have a little Chinese made uh, infrared uh, oven, uh, the microcontroller inside of which has had its stock firmware replaced with a free software uh -huh. project that <laughs> works a hell of a lot better. And I've made hardware mods to it to improve the, the accuracy and behavior of the temperature sensors and to get rid of the Chinese made masking tape that catches fire and stinks and all that sort of stuff. Um, but yes, you know, this allows all of the solder to melt at once, all the parts reflow. There's this lovely thing that happens with tiny little surface mount resistors and capacitors and such, where the surface tension in the molten solder causes them to auto align on the pads. It sort of pulls them into place. Only, and so only if you keep the pads separated. <laughs> yes, Keith has this yeah. problem that he <laughs> likes designing boards that are about this size, where the parts are so close together there isn't enough solder mask between the parts. <laughs> And as a result, uh, even on the production run of these, there's one Component. capacitor that's always about 20 degrees off from aligned right. And, you know, <coughs> we'll fix that in the next rev. Um, it's you know, already been updated in a few, a few thousands of extra space is all it would take. So um, do you get this back from the manufacturer's pre thing for you and everything? Or do you have to the, the circuit, circuit boards? boards? Yeah, they're either covered with gold enig. Or t or tin, yeah, depending upon what you ask for. Yeah, and that's, and by the way, all these, uh, a lot of our prototypes are on purple circuit boards. Those you of you that play the around, color? yeah, these are all from Osh Park, um, which I guess is in Portland. Yeah, um, they they have a lovely service where you can upload files, and some amount of time later, for very little money, you can get two and four layer boards back in units of three. Well, and the best part is when you design tiny circuit boards, the, mo the money is the money is scaled by area. So these prototype boards cost like 50 cents each. Yeah. It's like a two layer circuit board, you know, with precisions <coughs> of, you know, thousandths of an inch for They're cents. They're aggregating lots of people's designs onto <coughs> a panel. They're running maximum size panels and then they're chopping the panels up and sending the boards out priority mail. It's just an amazing service. It's, it's overnight for me. What? On, the, on their website, you can see the layouts of people's yeah. projects. Basically. Yeah, very few. Uh, they don't. They don't make them public by default, which is kind of weird. It's like you have to go and click to make your project public. It's like why not make it public by default? <laughs> Question. What, what is that again? Osh Park. Osh Park. O S H P A R K. P A R K. It's run by Lane. They are. They, Lane's that's like that's yeah. probably right now. I think it's probably the best place to get small quantities of cheap printed circuit boards in the U.S. It's a co-op. In the world. It's <laughs> co-op-ish. Co-op-ish. It's, it's actually a company. It's not really, It's not a co-op. It's oh, a commercial exactly. venture. Okay. Yeah, Yeah. I think it started out being co-op-ish, but it, it's a wonderful service. I don't care you know, if, if they, they actually... They use all free tools for all their stuff. I looked stuff. into them once, and it, it was a little frustrating because they said, well, we can either give it to you overnight or two months from now when we fill out the board. Well, that, that's, they're, that's they're, all been solved. Their, vo all, oh, okay. their, their, their okay. volume is so high now, they're yeah. turning boards almost every day. Yeah. Oh, cool. well, they, they do multiple two-layer runs per day mm -hmm. and a four-layer run every other every couple of days. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, and the cost is low. All the green circuit boards, uh, almost all the green circuit boards, except for some of our recent tiny little things, are from advanced circuits. And, and this uh, is from Colorado. Seed Studios in, in Shenzhen. Yeah. Okay, software stuff. <coughs> So BDL, BDL let me uh, uh, was building hardware, and uh, he was he he didn't want to do everything, so he decided to, to sign me up to do some of the software. Um, I hadn't done hardware in a long time, so I said, "Well, this is as close as I'm going to get to doing really cool stuff." So I'll, I'll do the software part, which is the tedious and boring part of the project. Um, uh, so so of course the the awesome part was I got to write an operating system. How many of you've written an operating system in the last couple of years? Yeah, isn't it fun? It's like, oh, you get to like ignore all the disasters that everybody else has ever done and create your own. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, and it's been it's been it's been interesting. Um, so um, the nice thing about using uh, the microcontrollers that we do 
is they all, all of them except the AVR, which was a, a ba largely abandoned, provide source level debugging for an embedded microcontroller. And these, these are all ARMs now, but even the 8051s, I wrote, a, uh, I wrote an embedded debugger for that, uh, source level debugger for that. So I had source level debugging for embedded computing. And, and if anybody's ever done embedded AVR computing with m Arduinos and doesn't have that, they, they don't know, they don't understand how it actually works in the real world. Nobody in the real world would ever use a microcontroller you didn't have source level, de so source level debugging for. Um, so the operating system I wrote is all written in C. It's co uh, cooperatively multitasking. Um, I thought about doing preemptive multitasking, and I was like, wait a minute, I'm writing a real-time system. If there isn't enough time per tick to get the work done in a cooperative environment, uh, preemptive is not going to help. And cooperative is a lot easier to analyze from a, from a stability and performance perspective uh, because you know where the preemption points are. And so there are a lot, a lot fewer risks in flying that when you make stuff changes. Uh, the flight progress uh, of the firmware is actually kind of tracked through multiple stages. Like, okay, first you're on the pad, and then you like the motor, and you're boosting, and then the motor burns out, and you're coasting, and then the, then you get to apogee, and then then you're in, then you're in drogue state as you're uh, floating down, and then the, you get to the main altitude, and then you're in main state, and then eventually the, the rocket stops moving, and you've landed. So we tell the user through the telemetry system, oh, the rocket is boosting right now. And then we detect through the accelerometer, oh, the ro rocket motor has burned out. We're coasting now. And by tracking it through states, it's a little simpler for us to do a simple state transition. It's like, well, when do you transition from boost to coast? Oh, you transition when the acceleration goes negative. When you transition from coast to, uh, to uh, drogue state? Oh, you do that when the, when the vertical speed goes, uh, goes through zero. Uh, so it's pretty easy to watch. Um, all of our stuff has USB connectivity, even this board. <laughs> Okay, this, this board has a, one of our tiny little ARM microcontrollers on it that has USB. And so you actually can plug this board into a carrier board that just has wires on it and has a USB connector. So everything should have USB. If you have a, make a microcontroller and you don't put a USB controller on it, you're, you're wasting my life. Um, <laughs> do you use the FTDI chips? No. Nope. What do you use for serial? So there is the I, I built I wrote software. a USB stack. There's the USB interface is in the microcontroller. Yeah, USB interface it's just is in the microcontroller. Wire and a couple of resistors and a connector. And yeah, FTDI is kind of an evil company. They decided that people who stole their stole their designs and and uh, uh, and tried to use their drivers, they would fry the the, the clones. Yes. Uh, so we've avoided using them. Um, uh, so we we uh, the little micro and besides the FTDI parts are expensive, right? The FTDI parts are like five bucks. You know how much this microprocessor cost me? It's an ARM 32-bit microprocessor with six, uh, 32 kilobytes of flash, six kilobytes of, of RAM, a USB controller, and you know 12-bit ADC, Spy, I squared C, serial, everything. It's less than a buck fifty. It's like, why would I spend money on somebody's closed source? Garbage? So what we realized at some point is there were enough. <laughs> manufacturers of little system on chips with ARM cores on them that had USB integrated that we didn't have to compromise on this. Yep. And from a user standpoint, you don't have to buy like a separate adapter board unless you're talking about one of these things that's so physically crazy small there's no room to put a real USB connector on. All right, so you note that our, our flight computers here, they all have they often have a USB connector. This one again is too small. There's no space for the USB connector, so it uses a uses an adapter board. Uh, so I, I, I wrote some USB serial port emulation. It uh, doesn't require a kernel driver on Linux or Mac or Windows, uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, the operating system actually has a little command line interface. So you know, you, the first thing you, that I always do is plug in the USB and, like, uh, and, and basically telnet to my flight computer, which is pretty fun. Um, and of course, it has uh, EEPROM on it to store the configuration and flight data. Um, the hardware. Yeah, so there's really two things on most of our boards that have to be calibrated. Um, one is the accelerometers, and the reason is that we do this thing where we want to be able to detect when the airframe's on the rail getting ready to be launched. <laughs> and so we have an operational thing in our software that says that if you power the board up and the rocket's nose up, then you're probably getting ready to launch. If it's on its side, laying on the bench or whatever, then you're not getting ready to launch. It should go into an interactive mode where you can do configuration, data download, and so forth. In order to have that work right, we have to make sure that we know what the accelerometer values look like when the board's nose up Ooh, or not. This is old. Yeah, this is old. And <coughs> um, with the old boards, we had analog accelerometers, and so that was a bigger deal than with the current ones where they're all digital parts. But we still do an accelerometer calibration 
uh, on the bench because we have this lovely 1G field we're sitting in. It's easy to get plus and minus 1G numbers. And then the other thing is that um, because we have radios, um, there are crystals for setting the frequency on those radios. And the crystals that we buy are you know, lovely, stable crystals, but their accuracy is a little dicey. Um, they can be off by just enough that <coughs> um, you know, it's worth calibrating the frequency on them on the bench so that we get the optimal radio performance. Well, it's required. On the Most of the time, if you don't calibrate, you can't receive it. Even you're going into regions where, where it's cold, you have the temperature to compensate? We have been very careful with our designs to compensate as much as we can. The fact that we're using, uh, what is it, 20 kilohertz deviation GFSK means that um, it's really not an issue with actually receiving the data link. Um, you have to drift really damn far before you lose the FM capture effect. So, and for rocketry, the reality is is that rocket is not is not up in that up in that area of the atmosphere for long enough for the electronics to even notice. And in, 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 in the finest of traditions, uh, if the boy wants motors to fly the next weekend, he can jolly well sit there and help calibrate product for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we pay for we pay for AP by. Uh, by a labor. <laughs> yeah, actually, he will literally be working for me this summer doing real work, which is going to be cool. Um, but uh, there's a long tradition of uh, you want to go to the launch this weekend. Well, we've got some product we need to ship before we go. Um, yeah, so it's cool. All the tools we're using, the C compilers uh, for the different processors are all open source things that are packaged in Debian. Um, one of the things that we think is really cool is doing all of the software builds on a Debian system. We actually have everything available that we need to build um, executables and installer images for Windows and Mac OS and uh, generic Linux and Android uh, all available on Debian. So we build all of this stuff out of one product source code tree and we have a release process where it's sort of one top level make and kaboom a whole bunch of deliverables fall out at the bottom that you know, we push one more button and they're shoved up to our website and we've done a software release. So um, cross-platform, all of this stuff, it's really pretty cool. And I mentioned Android. Um, <coughs> one of our ground stations now uh, is this variant that has a Bluetooth module on it. And so um, it converts from the UHF downlink from the flight computers into something that you can stand there with your phone. Um, because all of our ground station software on the laptops and on the phone does voice synthesis of the telemetry during flight, you can actually be watching the rocket and listening to, you know, it's now in coast and it's at this elevation and it's at this position downrange and all what that sort of stuff. It's pretty fast. Um, Why would there be latency? <laughs> well, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, clearly <coughs> by the time it says what the speed is, it might have changed. But the interesting things are that, you know, while the airframe is descending, I can tell people what, what apogee altitude we hit. It is, of course, a Barrow-derived apogee. And I can tell them how fast it went. You know, did that bus Mach 3 or not? I know that before the airframes hit the ground, <coughs> um, which is kind of cool. Are you going to change voices at all? The voices on, the, on Android, it's programmable, of course. Okay. The yes. voice is kind of interesting. We'll fix it. There, there is exactly one free <laughs> voice data set right. for the tool set that we're using. Um, we once met some folks who were in the advertising industry in New York and who were also rocket folks who promised that they would get some, you know, famous actress to record a voice sample set for us and then they never followed through. It was disappointing. But, you know, stuff happens. Uh, maybe someday. Okay, so another thing that we'll spend just a minute or two on is that, you know, I mentioned earlier that we don't just use free software for designing and building the rockets and the electronics and all that. We're actually running the small business associated with the avionics entirely using free software stuff too. Uh, all of our accounting, for example, is being done using free software tools, Ledger CLI. Um, this is the command line version of the Ledger tool. Um, if you have never like investigated free software tools for doing personal or small business accounting, um, you don't actually have to go buy Quicken and QuickBooks for everything. Um, <coughs> you know the fact that uh, the data for Ledger CLI is in sort of human readable text files that are eminently Git revision controllable makes us happy. Um, I love the fact that you know once I've closed out an accounting period. Um, Git will tell me if I oops someday and accidentally frob the data that we've already closed out. Um, I've written some Python scripts that use the REST interfaces in the Magento web storefront that we're using to pull all the sales transaction data, 
There's this tool called Reckon. If you haven't run into it, that's really pretty cool. It'll take a CSV file, you know, comma separated values, and it's sort of a Bayesian learning engine. So you can feed it like a transaction download from a credit union or something, and as you categorize transactions, it's learning. And so by about the third time it sees a particular monthly transaction, it proposes that this ought to go to such and such category, and you know, is that what you want? And you end up where you're basically just hitting enter over and over again to convert a month's worth of data after a while. So that's a really cool tool to know about if you're going to play with Ledger CLI. And then, of course, you know, <coughs> doesn't everybody use make files to do their monthly close? Um, <laughs> just, it, it's interesting how often I hear people talking about things that sound ridiculously complicated, and I realize that we're getting by with things that are really simple. Um, one thing that's not really simple is the web storefront we're using. Oh my God. After playing around with OpenCart and various other things, um, I landed on Magento. And version two of it is actually like, seems to be a pretty good open source project. Version one was under an open source license, but was definitely not a tractable community kind of project. Uh, unfortunately, it's a huge pile of PHP, which gets all of my allergic reactions going. Um, and yet, you know, I'm running it and I get to deal with it. <coughs> uh, on the plus side, it sort of does all the things you want to be able to do. It's really easy to set up different categories of customers, assign educational discounts, all that kind of stuff. All the things we wanted to be able to do, we've been able to do. And then the thing that kind of makes it work for me is that we actually subscribe to something that's not free. Uh, it's ShipStation, which is a software as a service offering. If you're trying to run a retail storefront sort of thing and have to ship stuff to people, it's magical. And for about 25 bucks a month, I get the whole shipping backend interface. Um, you know, I can print labels <coughs> for all the different services and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I just don't have to think about what happens when the postal service changes their interface and all that sort of thing. Um, and the interesting thing is some combination of the increased productivity in the shipping process and the fact that they give us discounted rates with all the carriers because they're aggregating lots of small businesses like us into one volume sort of transactions. Uh, the 25 bucks a month that I'm paying for that service I think is actually mostly made up for in the reduced shipping costs I get. So oh, yeah. it's, it's not quite free, but it's darn close to free. And, <coughs> you know, as in beer, not as in freedom, but whatever. <laughs> so then... We are almost out of time. We have a steaming pile of cool photos of notable flights, which I think we're going to end up mostly zipping through. I think before we dive into some of these, though, um, are there other folks that have burning questions you'd like to ask us before we sort of run out of the official time? Do you know of any uh, study groups that have done actual liquid flights? Yeah, so I, I actually failed before I mentioned the third category, which is that there are people doing amateur rocketry outside of the NAR and Tripoli uh, insurance and licensing and waiver application umbrella. Uh, there are a couple of clubs in Southern California in particular. There's a launch site in Mojave um, that is used by a lot of folks. There's a launch site in Central New Mexico at Spaceport USA that's used by various folks. Um, and there are, calling them clubs would be a stretch. There are associations of individuals interested in that category of amateur rocketry who collaborate to do things like build test stands at launch sites to go do stuff. But honestly, when you get to the point where you want to play with something like liquid propellants, uh, uh, hybrids are okay. We have folks within the Tripoli and NAR insurance umbrella fly nitrous oxide hybrids with some regularity, but uh, true liquid fuel things, you are very much outside the realm of what there is a sizable you know, population of people engaged in. It's, it's, there is it's a, a lot harder. There's a mailing list called AR for amateur rocketry. I can give you a point or two if you're interested where all of those folks hang out. I'm on that mailing list. I will admit that on most days <coughs> I just skim and keep going because they are arguing about you know what material to use for O-rings for the liquid oxygen tanks. And I just I, it's maybe someday I'll care. I don't right now. Yeah. Uh, you can you know you can have a heck of a lot of fun and you can get way above a hundred thousand feet and so forth with relatively straightforward, simple, safe to play with and use solids. And so it's hard to get too motivated. 
Unless, of course, your objective is, uh, there are people I know who are playing in amateur rocketry who really do want to end up, you know, with startups going single stage to orbit and things like that. And more power to them. But <coughs> that's, at some point, there's a threshold where it's like, is this really a hobby anymore? Yeah. Speaking of, is it a hobby anymore? Is there any amateurs that try to get to space? Yeah. Yes. Uh, rich amateurs. That's e a way harder. Now. And motor prices actually don't double with the letters. Well, not commercial ones, no. No. Yeah. So, I mean, like your A is a buck, so, your B so, is two. So don't be fooled. I mean, uh, things like Spaceship One's flight was amazing, right? But there's a huge difference between getting to an altitude and getting to an altitude with enough kinetic energy to actually go into orbit. Right. That's true. Yeah, you have and to be going Mach 15 to be in Leo, which means you have to get enough energy to get to 100 kilometers and, and then and still go be forward and still be at Mach, Mach 15, 15. Yeah. instead of and Spaceship One. Of course, was going zero miles per hour at when it hit space. And you know, when I talk about altitudes, these are apogees of folks flying solid. Rock, solid fuel rocket motors, yep. and so by definition, they are you know approaching you know zero velocity. Uh, there's always some downrange velocity, right? The, the, the flights are. We've actually seen a couple of like perfect vertical flights where the airframe didn't go over; it just sort of stopped and started sliding backwards. Really amazing, particularly when it's like 8,000 feet up and everybody's watching in binoculars to see an airframe tail slide, but. That's really rare. I've seen it like three times in a bu bunch of years. Um, much more normally, you're on a ballistic, you know, parabolic trajectory, and when you cross over at the top, you're at your point of minimum kinetic energy, but it's not zero. And you know, because of all the SpaceX recovery stuff now, has anybody been doing guided recovery? You yep. know, is that a hobby now? There is a contest that just started this year as a collegiate rocketry competition called the Argonia Cup, <coughs> run by our friends the Cloudbusters in Argonia, Kansas where the objective is to launch an airframe on a level two motor, which means no more than a full L, uh, go up at least seven or 8,000 feet, and then wow. using whatever means you desire, deliver a golf ball payload back to a pre-surveyed location. Mm -hmm. And it cannot, and, and the, the score is based on where it first touches the ground. So rovers on the ground don't count. Um, and this year there was a radio control remotely steerable parachute system, which uh, unfortunately they underestimated the forces that would be applied during boost. And so their camera tilted and they, all the guy could see was baby wheat. And so he did not know where he was through the heads up display thing. He had full control over the parachute, but he did not know which way to steer because he could get no landmarks. Okay, but no autonomous uh, guidance. Oh, people are working <laughs> on autonomous <laughs> as well. Okay. Yeah. There, was an, there was another. For, there, yeah, actually th there's, the there's lots of steps in the process, right? There's how to get the control systems to work, how to get the measurement systems to work, and then how to close the loop. Right. And so they're, they're there obviously people, working on pieces. There are people of that. trying to do UAV stuff as yeah. well. Yeah, we popped one out a couple years back, a, a quad. One, we had one and tethered to the rocket to help bring it back. We got tired of chasing them. Another one, we just did it as a lander uh, right. quadcopter that unfolded and yep. we drove it back to 50 So I fully expect, this was the first year of the Argonia Cup competition. There were three teams and the best score was about a quarter of a mile from the target. I fully expect next year that there'll be a dozen or more teams and somebody will probably nail the target. Because um, there were a bunch of folks there observing this year going, are these people for real and should we participate? I mention this in part because Altus Metrum is one of the corporate sponsors of that particular competition, in full disclosure. But I think it's a cool competition. I hope to see more teams out there next year. Yeah. Do they have a, like a radio beacon at the landing site, or is it all radio also? Uh, they provide the surveyed location before. Like GPS coordinates? Yeah, and I think they have a visual target as well. So the folks that are doing like heads up displays for manual or remote control have something to aim for. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, unfortunately, due to weather at the launch site, they had to push that competition out by a week this year, which meant it landed right on top of the NASA student launch in Huntsville, which Keith and I were committed to go down and help volunteer at. So we didn't actually get to go this year, even though we were like the big corporate sponsor. It was annoying, but whatever. It is a weather-dependent hobby. So, <coughs> Any other questions? So we have actually run to the end of the available time. I think the room is actually done. Yeah. 
available a little bit. We have it's lots of lunch cool time. pictures and videos and stuff if folks want to see them. Otherwise, I guess it's lunchtime. <laughs> Guys, thank you, sir. Yeah. Oh. Can you, can you there you go. Huh? I just work there. No, no, that's what I'm saying. But the name just sounds like no. uh, But you're using a little board. Yeah, he doesn't have cups. He wants to look at the board. <laughs> <laughs> oh, which board you want to look at? Oh, just uh, that your, your small uh, radios here. Absolutely. Sorry, I'm putting away too soon. Okay. Really tight. That's what I was going to say. The connectors look like they add a lot of, you know, uh, they do size add a lot of weight. weight. They do. Yeah. And, and, and I, we have flown them without to save the weight. Oh. 